All right, welcome. We're going to talk about spinal trauma for the paramedic student. As we go through this, we'll look at the specific types of injuries that are associated with just the spine. We've done the head already. We'll have some lessons that can kind of cross over from head trauma, and some of the treatments actually will also be the same. Uh, we'll start with the review of anatomy and physiology, and then we'll start going through injuries and eventually management. We discuss this in the brain trauma section as well, but a reminder that the meninges do continue down uh, into the spinal column, and so they have the same basic role as they do in the central nervous system in the brain uh, that they do down here in the spinal column. So with that, there are potential spaces that fluid can accumulate in and put pressure uh, on the spinal cord in, in a closed space, uh, which would be the passageway through each of the vertebrae. The spine cord itself travel, travels in the center of our vertebrae, just behind the body. The body is the portion of the, uh, the spine that sits on top of the spine below and the spine above it, the vertebrae above it. And so there's a couple different structures here. I'll let you review these as you need to. Um, of note for topographic anatomy, generally when we're palpating the back of the patient and feeling for their spine, we're feeling the spinous process of the bony arch. Now in this cross-section, you can also see the separation of these vertebrae by discs. The intervertebral discs are kind of um, gel-like structure, cartilage structure, and in the center of them, they're shaped kind of like a donut so that the spinal cord can travel around that shock-absorbing tissue. Now, in between each of the vertebrae, where they're connected essentially at the body of the vertebrae, there's a gel-absorbing or shock-absorbing type, type tissues made out of cartilage that helps cushion those bony processes so that they're not coming into contact with other bony structures. Now that's assuming that the patient has good intervertebral discs. The discs can burst and be herniated over time. They can be, uh, they get, they get degraded as we age. And so a risk of injury is potentially overloading the uh, vertebrae so that the body pinches an area of that uh, disc so hard that it bursts it. And once that bursts, it's likely going to swell, put pressure on the spinal cord, which is nearby and very sensitive to pressure, and can cause injuries like nerve root injuries. Obviously, more likely that that occurs in the lower region of the patient's back from lifting, but it can happen uh, throughout the patient's uh, vertebrae. The spinal cord is going to communicate from the body's organs, the peripheral nervous system, to the brain, and uh, vice versa, from the brain down. And so we have specific tracks that we know about and can provide for us a little bit of uh, anatomy knowledge so that when a patient has potentially a sinus symptom that we're trying to correlate with an injury we can't really see, we might be able to narrow down what type of injury specifically they have going on with just our detective skills. So in this picture, you can see we've got the separation of the meninges. You've got your dorsal root ganglion, spinal nerve coming off of the vertebrae, uh, basically between each vertebrae, I should say, uh, coming off the spinal co column. The central canal, gray matter and white matter. Again, the gray matter is made up of things like cell bodies that don't have any sheaths. The white matter generally made up of axons that have that myelinated sheath on them. Now, all of this is traveling down through the opening uh, in each vertebrae uh, from the brain and out of the foramen magnum in the skull. Now, the spinal nerves basically follow along the vertebrae that they're branching out from. And so if we separate our vertebrae, uh, the entire length of the back, into those regions we're probably aware of, cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar, sacral and cockajeal spine. So in those spaces between each vertebrae, there's branches of nerves that communicate with the rest of the body. Some of those branches are important and they're, to, they're a group of branches and nerves together that serve a role that might be helpful for us in assessment or understanding how the patient's body works. And so the cervical plexus branches off of the cervical spine between C1 and C5. And specifically, that plexus communicates, uh, including the uh, phrenic nerve that's communicating to the diaphragm, at, which is responsible for regulating breathing. And so if a patient has an injury above C5, it's likely that the cervical plexus is cut if that patient is paraplegic, quadriplegic rather, uh, and not breathing. So if they're not breathing, it's likely that it's a very high cut uh, if their spinal cord has been transected. The brachial plexus controls the upper extremities. So though if we have an injury here, it may mean that the patient is a quadriplegic. It's lower than the branching for the cervical plexus. So they shouldn't need ventilatory support if that's the region that we find that they have an injury to their spinal cord. The lumbar plexus is going to supply the skin and muscles of the abdomen. We'll talk a little bit more about that assessment uh, a little later. Uh, 
um, and down through the uh, front portion of the patient's body towards the genitalia. The sacral plexus communicates with the buttocks, perineum, and most of the lower limbs. So those plexus uh, are helpful to know. I would really focus primarily on the cervical plexus um, and then be aware of the others. Again, the cervical plexus has the phrenic nerve. So in your kind of early learning of spine uh, anatomy, you might have learned something like C1 through 5, stay alive as, as part of a poem, uh, C6, pick up sticks. So the idea there is that if you have an injury between C1 and C5, they are going to need you to help them stay alive because they're going to stop breathing on their own. This is showing a motor neuron with an integrated center, essentially an associate or an interneuron that allows for us to have uh, a reflex loop. And so the body's ability to have a reflex loop is just basically tying together both the sensory neuron and the uh, effector neuron traveling away from the spinal cord and traveling towards the spinal cord uh, and bypasses the need for the brain to respond so it can just cause a reflex and cause uh, a muscle to move, say, if somebody's touched something that's hot, for example. Spinal cord physiology is very similar to the physiology we discussed in the brain. So the spinal cord has a spinal cord perfusion pressure. The spinal cord perfusion pressure is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the extrinsic pressure. And the extrinsic pressure is kind of the pressure that's around uh, the spinal cord itself. So in cerebral perfusion pressure, we had the mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. And so there's more flexibility to some degree in between some of the spaces uh, down the spine than there is in the rigid skull. And so that does give rise to a little difference in our perfusion. That also means that when a patient has an injury, like a spinal cord injury, they might have some swelling. And that, smelling, that swelling that occurs in the cord space is going to cause more pressure, which will decrease perfusion to the spine. So our target map in patients that have isolated spinal cord injuries is in 90 millimeters of mercury uh, or above. Dermatomes can be helpful. Uh, the textbooks have a, a nice chart that I didn't include on this slide. I think it's a few slides down that shows for each of these nerve roots which portion of the body the dermatome covers. So dermatomes are helpful because they can help us identify which portion of the vertebrae might be injured, especially when we don't have tools like x-ray in the pre-hospital setting. So the idea here is when you find a patient and let's say that they are suffering a uh, complete cord transection and they're suffering spinal cord shock, neurogenic shock as a result. So the typical presentation is that the patient will have flushed red appearance below the level of injury and pale appearance above the level of injury because the blood vessels in the lower portion of the body, when the spinal cord is cut, will no longer receive information to constrict. So that line, that demarcation, is associated with a portion of the spine that's that's cut. And so if we know where that line is relative to our dermatomes, and again, memorizing these may be not the greatest, but have it available so that you can reference it on a chart or something, uh, you'll be able to kind of identify which portion of the patient's spine is likely to be injured, specifically with the line that you see or the signs and symptoms you see at the dermatome. Again, we're going to be utilizing our primary assessment of X, A, B, C, D, and E. Again, with patients that have spinal cord injuries, they may also have traumatic brain injuries and could certainly have multi-systems trauma. So we're going to limit this to primarily patients that have specific spinal cord injuries uh, in our assessment. So all the same stuff is going to go on. However, we still need to take into account if the patient has a spinal injury, do we need to provide C-spine precautions? And does that entail backboarding the patient? So there's a lot of different terms that you'll come across for basically backboarding, spinal motor restriction, spinal stabilization, spine mobilization, all really kind of saying the same thing. Limiting or restricting the movement that the patient has of their cervical spine as a means of protecting it from further injury. And so you will follow your local protocol in determining whether or not you uh, can clear a patient C-spine. Clearing a patient's C-spine, though, is a high-risk situation for liability because if the patient has other things going on, they may not be able to adequately answer your questions, but you may take them as being uh, absent or saying no when the patient in reality does have an injury. And so there is the risk of clearing a C-spine that's too high risk. And so remember that we want to try and limit the altered level of consciousness in making this decision. Distracting injuries have to come into play. Intoxication can all make it harder for the patient to give us reliable assessment cues when we're trying to clear their C-spine. If the patient does have an airway injury, consider whether or not you need to have C-spine precautions and use a jaw thrust maneuver. 
Breathing for these patients in specific cases with high injuries, they may actually stop breathing, so we may need to provide ventilatory support to them. Now, in the case of an isolated spinal injury, that ventilatory support we're likely going to be giving to help maintain their SATs and normal end tidal CO2. If the patient's breathing normally, they likely would need help potentially with oxygenation or to uh, some degree maybe have good SATs if they're not experiencing something like shock. Patients that have bradycardia in the presence of spinal cord injuries may indicate a type of neurogenic shock that occurs. Now, generally, just off the top of our head, when a patient is in shock, usually the body's response is to increase the heart rate as a means of increasing patient's cardiac output. But in this case, unfortunately, depending on where the injury is, the spinal cord may have been cut in the area that communicates with the heart. The brain may be telling the heart to increase its rate because it's seeing that it's not getting enough perfusion as a means of managing cardiac output, but that signal may not actually make it to the heart, and the heart may be overstimulated by this parasympathetic nervous tract, leading to bradycardia. That's going to lead to these patients, unfortunately, going into more progressed shock more quickly because they can't compensate on their own. Remember that in your assessment circulation of the skin, they may have that clear demarcation of color that indicates where a spinal cord injury uh, has occurred. Get, uh, get your GCS trending and do further specific neurological assessments depending on the patient's condition and complaints to determine where it is that we have communication and where communication is absent. Those types of findings, especially the ones that we may do in our secondary assessment, will help us specifically talk about portions of spinal cord injuries that occur when the whole cord is not transected. Make sure to, if this patient is suffering shock, make sure that we cover them and treat them uh, with warmth in the patient's compartment. Make sure that we have normal temperature in these patients because that's one of the critical pieces to helping maintain patients' compensation for shock. When we're doing our rapid uh, neurologic exam in the primary assessment, there's a few goals that we have that aren't essentially the same as our secondary assessment. So when we're on scene and we're trying to limit our scene time so that we can get off scene towards definitive care rapidly, we're going to first try and identify whether or not the patient has a suspected spinal cord injury. And that's going to happen when we first walk up and we try to make the determinations whether or not we need to hold manual C-spine. Determine next how the patient is going to be moved from the scene. So that's going to be part of your neurological exam, making sure that you've got CNS assessments before putting them on the backboard or whatever it means that you have of moving them. Get a baseline before we move them in any case. Find any obvious deficits like those that we'll find when they squeeze our fingers or maybe push against our feet in a limited secondary assessment that we might move into the primary when we're trying to evaluate for a backboard. And complete circular, circulation, motor, and sensory exams in all extremities, uh, making note of those on your re frequent reassessments as well. Once we get through the determination of getting off scene and we're now transporting, we're now going to try and dig in and see if we can get a little bit more knowledge about the spinal cord injury we already now suspect. So in our thorough secondary neurologic exam, our first goal is to determine the extent of the injury and try to identify loosely which spinal nerves or which part of the vertebrae is involved in this injury. Check skin, check CMS again, and try and determine whether or not patients have some sensation or motor function uh, in their extremities and throughout their body as well. Sometimes you'll find deficits that are different regions or hemispheres of the patient's body and not in others. Now, sometimes you can't narrow it down to very, very specific points, and that's okay as long as we're still identifying the overall situation that we have before us and managing it appropriately. There's a wide variety of patients' presentations that they may have on their neurological assessment. So treat signs and symptoms as you find them and support their spine based on what you think the damage is from your assessment. If you do have a dermatome chart, this is the picture I was mentioning before, you can utilize this to try and loosely associate with their injury site or their lack of sensation or line of demarcation to try and get an, identif uh, an identification of which dermatomes are where. But I like this little section that we have here, loss of sensation at the clavicles. You can memorize with being associated with the C4, C5 injury. Don't have to worry about the dermatome. That's pretty easy. Injuries at about the level of the nipples, a T4 injury. Injuries at the umbilicus, a T10 injury, and uh, injuries at the pelvic rim, a T12 injury. So this makes that uh, overall chart much easier to manage in trying to just get some topographical anatomy for our memorization. When we're managing patients and we need to assess them by rolling them over, maybe with a log roll, to try and determine if they have injuries to their spine, we want to make sure that we're communicating with our patients appropriately. If we don't want them to move their head, then it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we ask them 
questions that will not provoke them to answer by nodding their head. So inform your patients to simply tell you when you ask them yes or no questions and try not to nod. Also, when you're moving them, rolling them, or doing anything along this path, you want to make sure that you're talking to them because they only have the view that they have from the ba- laying on their back. They can't see around them because we're restricting their head movement, and that can be certainly concerning for the patient. In some degree, if they don't know that we're about to move them, they may have a reflex, reach out and grab something, and potentially put our backs at risk. Now, there's a variety of signs and symptoms that are associated with specific types of spinal cord injuries. And so often there's going to be some type of pain or some change in sensation in the patient's neck or back. They may also have deformities like step-offs or depressions uh, when assessing and feeling for each spinous process. Patients may be guarding or splinting their neck muscles, which may be an indication that there's also underlying uh, spinal cord risk for injury. Certainly presentation of numbness or tingling Uh, paralysis, signs and symptoms of neurogenic shock. And in some cases, there may be a priapism, which is uh, um, an artificial erection because of the opening of blood vessels when a patient has um, a cord transection, not communicating with vessels below the level of injury. Now, here's some of the spinal cord injury signs and symptoms in general, but we're going to get a little bit more specific when we see some of the injuries here in a little bit. Just like we had in our brain injury, we want to make sure that we're not allowing for secondary injuries to occur. So we want to limit the effect of hypovolemia, hypotension, and hypoxia in patients that have an uh, isolated spinal cord injury. Now, if patients have shock like hypovolemic and or neurogenic shock or multi-systems trauma, it's going to make our job a little bit harder in maintaining that minimum high perfusion of the central nervous system. So we may be left with dealing with the patient's other risks like internal hemorrhage. Let's talk about the classification uh, that we utilize in determining and naming these types of injuries. So there's a primary spinal cord injury, which is very similar to the primary head injury, in which the injury itself happened at the moment of impact. The the kinematic energy that was translated from this patient's motion or the thing that was applied to their body impacted a portion of their spinal cord and caused damage. That's their primary injury. Secondary injuries are injuries that occur after that initial impact. They may be because of some thing that the patient's dealing with in general, maybe because of some lack of appropriate treatment. Uh, when we're managing patients, there's a wide variety, but again, those will make primary spinal cord injuries worse. Secondary injuries, if we're splitting hairs, can be separated into intrinsic causes and systemic causes. Intrinsic causes are problems inside the spinal cord. So that's likely going to be perhaps some swelling or some blockage that's not allowing now CNS to get to a region, uh, CSF to get to a region and oxygenate nor blood flow. And so that may cause an intrinsic. Systemic causes are things that occur outside the spinal cord like hypovolemia, hypoxia, and the others. Here's a list of secondary injury in those classifications. Now, something to know about the spinal cord is often there's going to be swelling in the spinal cord after an initial injury, and often that swelling will peak at about 24 hours after the injury. So there's a lot of time for this this tissue to start to swell and restrict blood flow uh, well during our transport and well afterwards. So patients generally don't get a good answer when they're assessed in the hospital as to will they regain some function associated with their spinal cord well after 24 hours because it takes time to see what damage was done. And on top of that, overall, what damage will be reversed is still something that will have to be determined in therapy. Now, there are sprains and strains of the structures of the neck and the cervical uh, column that include the spinal column. And so sprains and strains have very similar terminology here as they do in musculoskeletal injuries. Now, the goal here is to identify spinal cord injuries and properly manage them from the get-go. We don't want to find this after we've maybe been sloppy doing other things that now they have a spinal cord injury that we just realized and perhaps our movement before has put them at risk. The impact on the patient's life of not recovering from their spinal injury is dramatic and impacts well beyond just them themselves and the things that they do. They'll take an impact on their family, requiring more care financially and just the burden of physical care that has to be done outside of the folks that they'll hire to do do so. So this is something we really want to try and get right from the beginning. There are some assessments that we can perform. So the Babinski reflex uh, is generally not in this presentation in adults unless there's a central nervous system injury. And we talked about this in the brain as well. So normally, if you were to take some object and rub it from the heel of the patient's foot up towards their big toe, in the adult, if they didn't have a spinal cord injury, their finger, their rather their toe would go inward and they would curl their big toe inward. But Babinski's sign is 
present when an adult has a central nervous system injury in which we run that object up from the heel to the, the big toe and their big toe goes up and backwards. So we call that dorsiflexion. And so when that occurs, that's a, a presentation that they have a positive Babinski sign and that this patient likely has central nervous system trauma.